what every Adventist scientist should know, the philosophy of science. Now, I said every Adventist, uh, actually, I think every Christian scientist should know this as well. Uh, although, I have to w watch out because the word Christian scientist can uh, have a different meaning. Uh, perhaps they should know it too. Um, <coughs> but, um, but in particular, Adventists cannot ignore science. Um, the only Christian medical school in the United States happens to be run by Adventists. An Adventist, this is not an isolated phenomenon. Adventists run a medical school in Mexico. And in several other areas as well, we kind of cooperated with a medical school in India, um, which has a fairly large Adventist presence at this point. Uh, I don't think it's actually. Velour uh, and the um, dean is a seventh Adventist. Yes. So. Uh, yeah, at Valor. There's also one in Argentina, um, which is rather amazing for a Christian denomination. When you realize that in the United States there was one other attempt to run a Christian medical school, Oral Roberts University, and it failed. And Loma Linda, to its credit, I think, uh, managed to pick up a number of the students that got caught in the middle of that failure. And, uh, and graduate them from here. Um, <clears throat> that means that we cannot just close our eyes to science. Um, I don't think Adventists have ignored science. There's uh, the Adventists have the Geoscience Research Institute, which has been around for some time. A church-sponsored institute, which is different, by the way, from places like An Answers in Genesis or uh, Creation Ministries International or the Institute for Creation Research, all of which are Christian, but are uh, not really sponsored by any uh, particular denomination. Um, we've stuck a little bit of our money where our mouth is. And we also have a journal that's kind of supported by the Adventist Church that's devoted strictly to questions about science and religion. Now, one narrow aspect of science and religion, but it, it turns out to be one of the, probably the biggest one. And unfortunately, Adventist educators have not always transmitted this information to students in an effective way. I would say at some schools, they've done a pretty good job. At other schools, they've done a so-so job. At some schools, they haven't done a good job at all. And uh, some of that is because of people's different philosophies. Some of that is just because of no knowledge of the subject. And one of the things that I hope to get started, and I don't know whether we'll actually do it, but uh, maybe we can, is to bring some of the information that, at least in my opinion, every Adventist scientist should know to the attention of people who are educators so that it can actually get into Adventist education and every Adventist scientist or at least every scientist that is educated as an Adventist will know. And who knows, perhaps some of this uh, in some form will eventually reach Adventists who are going to secular universities anyway because I think they should know it as well, although it may not be quite as easy to uh, get the information to them. We're trying to correct that problem and right here, right now, um, what I'm going to do is try to identify the subjects that should be taught and uh, the reason that I think they should be taught and you can dispute this if you want to, they relate to either the Bible or Ellen White or both and they relate to areas of controversy. I mean, um, I'm not going to say much about smoking because that's something that's pretty much universal now. It's bad for you. Everybody agrees with it. Um, and although I suppose we might touch on it briefly in some other context, that's not much of a point. Um, I think that 
one of the points that needs to be made is that some of these subjects have actually been researched fairly heavily by Adventist scientists. And if you're running an Adventist institution and you don't bring Adventist research into it, something is wrong. And finally, I think that they involve important theological questions. Now again, uh, I, when you see what we're going to be discussing, you're certainly welcome to differ on, uh, in matters of opinion, but I, uh, those are the criteria that I see as being important uh, to selecting subjects that, in fact, um, Adventists should know about. Now, here are the subjects. I'm just going to list them, and then um, I'm not going to discuss them much right now because the intent is next week to discuss one of these subjects, the next week after that to discuss another one, and next week after that to discuss another one. Uh, in some cases, I will be allowing people who are experts in the field to discuss them if, I, if uh, Lord willing, and they're able to do so because uh, they can give you firsthand information on some of this. Um, the first one that we'll discuss is the philosophy of science. I have some interest in that and some knowledge, and that's the one we're going to discuss today. Then there is a whole section of things, is there a God? An important theological question. And we're going to be discussing the origin of the universe. We're going to be discussing the privileged planet, that our Earth is not only um, made for human habitation, it's also made for human discovery. And that is not a question that you can answer with fitness. The origin of life, of course, because that distinguishes between theism and deism in a very important way. If the origin of life required some kind of intelligence, then through a very short chain of evidence, one can argue that it required a supernatural intelligence. And naturalism is dead, not only in the formation of our universe, but also in its actual function, once it gets going. The task of unguided evolution, that is to say, what does evolution really have to do in order to be a viable theory? And unfortunately, that question has been ignored and fuzzed for some time. Because once you realize what the task is, you realize that evolution really isn't equipped to do that. And finally, the problem of genetic entropy that we've briefly spoken about before. Um, and that grades into the next question, because the question of genetic entropy argues not only that unguided evolution can't make it, but also, unless you want to keep God pushing data into the universe, you can't have it that old either. That is to say, it's an argument for short age. Um, for those of you who are curious, the, uh, the background to the slide is a nebula that is sometimes called the eye of God, for what I think are obvious reasons. <clears throat> the next question that we will deal with is how old is life on Earth? And a very closely related question, was there a worldwide flood? And um, under that, we're going to discuss widespread layers. We're going to discuss turbidites. We're going to discuss rates of erosion and uh, the implications of them, particularly in places like the Alps and Mount Everest. Periconformities and soft sediment deformation. Uh, where did all the time go and how do uh, rocks stay soft for six million years? Um, paleocurrents, 
uh, carbon-14 dating, which is the one that I plan to talk about next week if uh, everything goes right. Uranium lead dating. And then uh, some, uh, something about a new uh, subject that's just coming up, erosional features and uh, specifically involving massive flooding, including, of course, the current granddaddy of them all, the Brett's floods. Although, as we'll see, the Brett's floods may, may actually be one of the smaller, or, or smaller than the, the biggest flood. And then something that I would call challenges to young life creationism. And um, that includes the Coconina sandstone. That includes the Yellowstone fossil forest. It includes ice cores. And it includes radiometric dating in general. I think there are two things. Number one, some of those have, I, I believe anyway, been largely neutralized. And it's important for us to understand um, our history in this regard. Uh, but some of them need to be introduced to kids so that when they get to graduate school or wherever they go, or maybe postgraduate education, maybe life in general, they don't feel like they never told us anything about this stuff. These are the arguments, and they need to be explicated, um, along with ways that various people deal with them. Um, I'm sorry? How long, is young life creationism? How long is young life creationism? Well, young life creationism does not refer to the age of the earth itself. Um, it refers to the age of life on earth. And um, probably anything under about 100,000 years would be considered young life. Because most people would concede that uh, you get under 100,000 100, years, radiometric dating has hopelessly broken at that point. Um, and uh, at that point, you, you can make a good argument for um, some kind of reliance on the biblical record. And now, if you're asking me personally, it depends. I think there are very good arguments for putting life uh, of putting at least the flood and therefore the life that you see in the fossil record at uh, under about 3,500 BC, maybe 3,600 uh, at the outside. And there are some arguments that are starting to make, uh, make a case that uh, perhaps we're looking at about 2,500, maybe even 2,300 BC, in which case we're looking at 6,000 years. Um, but that's another discussion. And perhaps after we get done with this, um, I can outline some of the uh, arguments uh, pro and con in those various questions. But if you get under, if you get under let's say, 20,000 years, I think you're pretty, much, um, you're pretty much into the creationist camp and outside of, uh, outside of any remotely a uh, reasonable evolutionary scenario. And you're also into a range where you can take the biblical record in Genesis and believe it pretty straightforwardly. And then finally, I think that for Adventists, there's a second category that needs to be addressed, and that has to do with Ellen White's health messages. I think the health messages in general. Um, and for that, if we are lucky, we will have um, we will have uh, Leonard Brand talk about that. Uh, if not, I can uh, I, uh, present for him, I think, because the concepts are not that hard. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk about alcohol. And uh, again, we'll, because alcohol is one of those that has gone the reverse of tobacco. Whereas tobacco Adventists used to be ahead of the curve and people criticized them for being unscientific but do so no longer. 
For alcohol, many people will turn around and say, well, alcohol is good for you a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. And I think that, uh, I think that any Adventist that is trying to look at science and health needs to deal with that subject. Uh, but, okay, those are, the, those are the things that immediately pop up as being kind of essentials. If you're not getting this in a course, you're not getting a fully Adventist education. Okay, so that's where we're heading. And today I'm going to talk about the philosophy of science. Um, and uh, the first thing to say is that science is not a separate thing all by itself. Science, in fact, is a branch of philosophy. It's called natural philosophy, and that is why if you get a degree in chemistry or physics, you get a PhD. You don't get a science doctorate, by and large. That PH means doctor of philosophy. And before you say that's just an old relic that doesn't... Um, hold water anymore, think about it. The statement that all truth can be determined by science is not a scientific statement. How can you test that experimentally? Can you falsify that? Is that reproducible? No. It's a philosophical statement. And one of the problems that it has is something called the demarcation question, which we're going to go into in some more detail. The problem is telling the difference between science and non-science. And it turns out not to be as easy as it looks. In fact, there are people who have abandoned that quest entirely. And I sympathize with them, and they may even be right. And we're going to discuss the implications of that point later on. Now, the philosophy of science has to have some kind of uh, material to work with. And there are two ways of doing it. And one of them is to try to think what science should be. And we found that people who do that don't necessarily do a good job at science. Uh, Francis Bacon being one of the, the key evidences here. But the other thing that, that uh, the philosophy of science does is it's intertwined with the history of science. That is to say, you see what scientists did in the past, you see what the arguments were, and then you try to generalize from those arguments. And that's probably the best way to do the philosophy of science. And so we're going to hear a little bit about the history of science. Now, the first thing is, well, what is science? Well, most people would say physics is science. It's kind of the classic science. Is mathematics? Well, it's more, that's more almost philosophy. Again, it's a, uh, mathematics doesn't say anything about the real world, whatever that is. And we're going to discuss the real. We're going to find out the real world is stranger than anybody thinks. But um, physics and chemistry, probably exception, uh, are, can be accepted as science. Observational biology, the stuff you can go out and test, um, probably belongs with science. Um, historical biology, evolutionary biology is. Um, it deals with the past and it's not testable in exactly the same way. And in fact, evolutionary biologists always want you to think that they are, uh, that they're just as good as physics, the theory of evolution is just as solid as the theory of gravity. In fact, as Jerry Coyne once remarked, evolutionary biology is way down on the pecking order of science. And the reason why is because it's hard to test the past. And historical geology belongs in the same place, although you do have observational geology that has a much more solid foundation. That there is, in fact, this difference between trying to say what's happening right now, which you can go out and uh, do 
tests on, observations, uh, experiments. And um, when you're dealing with the past, you can't experiment with it directly. And finally, there are things that kind of are outside of science altogether, things like history and art and religion and law, um, which makes it interesting that people relied upon a lawyer, specifically a judge, to figure out what science was in the case of uh, um, the uh, uh, Judge Jones in, in the Dover case. What is the what does the law professor have it to do with science? Uh, but um, yeah, I guess you can think logically, but uh, but you need evidence. That's the whole point of science today, anyway. And then you have things like medicine, which are kind of strange hybrids that have some science and some what they would call art. Well, to go back again, we'll follow the history. Uh, it actually begins further back than this. There was debate as to exactly what matter was, whether it was finely divisible or not, or whether when you got down to very small amounts you would wind up with things that couldn't be cut. Literally in Greek, a tomos, which of course we got the term atom from. Um, and as we'll find out, the present atoms are not uncuttable, and so it turns out to be a, uh, a bad name. But that's one of the strange things about history is that it leaves those kinds of odd things laying around. And Plato would talk about form versus matter. That is, matter being you know all of these chairs, but they have imperfections in them. And the ideal chair is something that doesn't really exist. Well, you think about, tr you draw triangles. Every time you draw a triangle, the lines are actually th measurably thick. Because you can't draw a, thi a triangle with infinitely thin lines. But a really, truly triangle is one of those with infinitely thin lines. You see, and so matter, you can try to make it into forms, but it really doesn't quite fit. And in fact, in some readings in Plato, matter doesn't even have any properties of its own. It's only that forms are imposed upon it. And this means that if you really want to know the truth, what you have to do is engage in some very careful thinking. Well, Aristotle, who is Plato's pupil, started talking about something that was a little bit different. His, his matter wasn't just totally formless. It had innate properties, and if it um, was, for example, made out of fire, which they thought was an element at that time, um, it went up because the property of fire is to go up in air. Uh, on the other hand, if you had water, the property of water was to come down in, fire, uh, in air. And in fact, earth would come down even faster in air, and earth would even go down in water. And so things sought their own level. Um, so you had innate properties of matter. And he believed that observation counted for something. Uh, and he was a pretty careful observer. And so for a long time, people didn't find mistakes in his uh, synthesis. And he became somebody you just didn't disagree with most of the time. Um, moving on rather rapidly past the Middle Ages, we come to Francis Bacon, who said that uh, observation is even more important than theory. Now, I'm not sure that Bacon himself actually made this observation, but it was very congenial to many theologians who felt that since God had ultimate freedom, he could do anything he wanted to, and you couldn't think him into doing anything. If you really wanted to know what God did, the best thing to do is to look and see what he did. And so at this point, you have observation. And I think this is a fair statement of where many people think science actually begins, is that 
When the observations become more important than a theory, if you wanted to find out how many teeth a mule has, rather than asking, well, how many teeth does a horse have and how many teeth does a donkey have and so how many teeth should a mule have, you open his mouth and you look. Somewhere along the way, people started getting the idea that, in fact, if you're going to be doing science, it should be reproducible. That is, if you do something in your lab and somebody else does something in their lab, you should come to the same result. And if not, there's some difference that you haven't accounted for. <coughs> and from that, and perhaps with a certain reinforcement, people started getting the idea that science follows laws. Now, I haven't included uh, Copernicus in this because Copernicus made a proposition for how the celestial mechanics ran. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't so much an emphasis on the laws it was as it was an emphasis on the mathematics of it. And uh, Galileo really got started on, on what laws would do and that, that, that nature would always follow these laws. And um, uh, this was continued with Kepler. And then once Newton came along, it was pretty much sold to everybody, at least as far as the scientific community was concerned. Nature followed predictable laws that you could write down on a piece of paper, and they were mathematical. And now, the scientists still could not deduce these laws from first principles. And scientists are still trying to do that, by the way. Grand unified theory of everything is supposed to be something that has to be true regardless just because it's mathematically that way. And Newton couldn't explain at his time why a body that was thousands of miles, perhaps hundreds of thousands of miles away, would be attracted to another body that there would be some kind of force pulling them together. He couldn't explain that. And in fact, he said, uh, hypothesis non fingo, and pardon my Latin, which is basically, I have no clue as to why. Um, I, don't, I don't have any good hypothesis. And now, this tempted many people to get into a syllogism. All of nature follows laws. Um, that means that nature never does anything strange. So miracles can't happen in nature. And you know, if you're a theological person, you might even say, well, God's not going to interrupt his own laws. And so that meant that there's no such thing as a miracle at that point. And you start seeing where science starts looking at miracles with great skepticism. Um, to continue on, um, Lavoisier, who died in the uh, uh, French Revolution, uh, was kind of the father of chemistry, uh, taking, destroying the last relic of uh, alchemy, which is um, phlogiston theory, and giving us our modern day oxygen theory of combustion. And then a little later, uh, Dalton proposed in the modern era the idea of atoms because things combined in certain specified um, ratios. And this meant that you could have molecules that were con consistently cons uh, containing one molecule of something and one molecule of something else, or perhaps one and two, hydrogen and chlorine making hydrochloric acid, um, oxygen and water in a two to one ratio making water, uh, oxygen and hydrogen making uh, water in, a, in that sense, in a one to two relationship. And then as time went on, people started applying this kind of thing to geology and uh, they started saying, you know, the only forces that are 
that you'll find in geology are forces that we now know about, number one, and they're in, applied with approximately the same magnitude as we have now. And that traces its um, way through Hutton and Lyell. And then you have biology first with a creationist, Linnaeus, who, who uh, tried to find uh, created kinds and later decided that he'd perhaps uh, the species were a little more restrictive than he realized at the time. Um, and then uh, Charles Darwin, who tried to show that you could go from one species to another and therefore from one genus to another and therefore from one uh, family to another and therefore all the way so that you could start with a single-celled organism diverged to other single-celled or organisms, diverged to multi-celled organisms, and pretty soon you could get from uh, amoeba to man. And finally, people tried to make this, uh, where all of nature follows laws and there are no exceptions, into psychology. Now we're talking about not just the world around us, but we ourselves and our minds. And psychology tried to explain how we don't really think as well as we, do, we think we do. And to a certain extent, they have a point, although, of course, if you, they applied it to themselves, they'd immediately realize that this is a problem. Um, but people like Freud and Skinner, for example, uh, would try to explain everything on the basis of uh, material uh, laws that they could deduce. Now, it's very tempting when you do this to say that science is a study of the reproducible, okay, which we talked about before, and I think that's probably true. That, by the way, has several advantages. Number one is that lab A and lab B can determine independently what truth is. You're not dependent on some kind of official uh, very version of truth. Um, Science doesn't have a pope and a set of cardinals, although I'm sure there's some people right now who would like that to happen. Um, and the second thing is, of course, that it allows science to be self-correcting. If somebody tells a lie about what happened in their lab, sooner or later other people are going to try to do the same thing, and they're not going to get the same results, and so the person will be found out. And so science is not only self-correcting, but it's, there's an impetus to honesty in science that would not be present where you have somebody who can basically say whatever they want to and there's no way to prove them wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm solidly in favor of the idea that science is a study of the reproducible. But then, of course, sci if, is science the search for truth? Well, if you insist that the truth must be reproducible, which is pretty easy to do, then the truth must be reproducible. That means that we just don't have all the variables, but we don't need anything that's unusual or that has to do with uh, uh, breaking of what we'd call natural law. Um, and the idea started gaining currency that we're continually piling on more truth. Okay, Newton knew some things, and Faraday knew some more things, and Maxwell knew some more things, and uh, Lord Kelvin knew some more things, and you know, pretty soon you have uh, all of these laws that are being piled up, and we're getting more and more accurate refinements of measurements, and more and more accurate theories, and um, science is just advancing. Well, that triumphalism, that put science in charge of everything should have died in 1905. Unfortunately, it didn't. And we still have remnants of that kind of thing. Where science is simply, it, science never has to worry about major corrections. Because in 1905, we discovered that simultaneous doesn't have any meaning. Well, some of us did, and others did in the, in the succeeding decades that things that we think are obvious, in fact, are not. And that if uh, objects are traveling with very high speed, 
that processes inside of them appear to slow down. And that's true even if the objects are traveling in high speed going around you. And then we discovered that if you're in gravitational field like we do, things slow down a little bit. And in fact, people have to take this into account when they're doing GPS. They have to figure out how many milliseconds you can, uh, you're going to be off because you're first on Earth in a gravitational field, then you're in a rocket ship heading out of Earth in a higher gravitational field because acceleration counts for gravity. And then once you get into orbit, how fast will the clock go then? Why is that important? Because in order to get your position down to the nearest foot, those clocks out there have to be beeping at a precise, putting out signals, I should say, not beeping, that's, that's um, uh, oversimplification, but the, they have to be putting out signals at a precise time so that you can time the difference in the arrival of the signals. So this actually has practical relevance. Um, it's not just, well, it's down to the 99th percentile and, and you could go to the moon with, uh, with Newton, and you could. Um, but there are some things that you can't do with Newton that you can do with Einstein. Relativity and then quantum mechanics challenged in, uh, in the opinion of virtually all uh, physicists, successfully challenged the Newtonian worldview. And all of a sudden, what science has told us for centuries turned out to be incorrect. Well, incorrect in very small amounts, but very important amounts in certain applications. Now what are you going to do? Most people realized at that point that inductivism was not a way to find absolute truth. Now, relative truth, yes, kind of, you know, uh, but but not, not absolute in the way of scientifically perfect. And so science got taken down a notch on philosophy. Um, so what happened was, well, people tried to say, well, we're only going to believe the things that we're absolutely sure of. And those are the things that we can see with our senses. Only sense data are reliable. Well, that has some problems with it. First of all, I see a bright thing up in the sky. Um, isn't there a sun there? Doesn't everybody get to see the sun in a certain approximate position? Uh, why are we trying to deny that, there's, that, that we can be absolutely sure that there's a sun? Uh, so you couldn't really limit truth to sense data, number one. Number two, sense data are sometimes unreliable. If you're a blind person, you can't see a rainbow. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist for sighted people. And finally, we don't even trust our senses to tell for sure what's hot and cold. Well, they're sort of reliable, but they're not absolutely reli reliable, and they're ways of fooling people into thinking something is hotter or colder than it is. And you can even document this. And we say, trust the thermometer and not the person's hand. So even the sense data are kind of failed. And the logical positivists, for all they're trying to be sure that we never believe anything that's not true, finally have given up and pretty much everybody has agreed that they didn't have the truth, the absolute total truth. Well, that means that science can't prove anything. Well, it can sure suggest stuff, but it isn't absolute in the way that people wanted absolute truth. And of course, that means that it can't be used to prove some things false in quite the way that you'd like to. Well, Popper, Karl Popper, was kind of the last gasp of this trying to connect science to absolute truth. Maybe science can still falsify theories. It's not that the theory is uh, so much we can't say what's true, but we can say what's false. 
There's a problem with that. One of them is that that's not what science is all about. Science, scientists are not trying to produce theories that will be falsified. That's an easy task. Rather, they're trying to find theories that could be falsified, but in fact aren't. And what they really want is predictive power. They want to be able to say, if you have circumstances A, B, C, and D, if you follow that through, eventually you'll get to F. And not G or H or I or J or some other thing. That is to say, if you're looking at a if you're looking at uh, the pathway of a projectile in space, perhaps the moon, you will say that it eventually will come here and not up here, down here, in some other position. That's what a real scientist wants to be able to do. If you pour these chemicals in, you will get this reaction every time. And you can reliably say you won't get this reaction or that reaction or no reaction, that you'll get a reaction and it's the reaction you want. That's what scientists really try to do. Now, it also turns out that some basic theories turn out to be very difficult to falsify because all you do is you modify the theory a little bit here and then all of a sudden th what you thought was a good falsification of the theory no longer falsifies it. Um, Many basic theories have minimal contact with data, so it's pretty hard to falsify them. And if it looks like it's falsification, people who believe in the theory can always say, well, you know, that's just one of those things we can't explain, and we'll put it up on the shelf. Now, this all sounds theoretical, but let me give you an illustration. The planet Uranus was found and its orbit was charted. And it mostly followed standard Newtonian physics. But something odd was noticed that it seems to be going faster than it needed to go, and then in a little bit it started to slow down. And it was pretty close to what Newton said, but it wasn't exactly. And so what people would try do is they would say, well, that's something I can't explain, but you know, Newton works so well for everything else, uh, there's probably some explanation out there. Well, some bright people said, well, what if there was another planet? And it would speed up coming towards the planet and slow down going away, and it would drift outward slightly while it's close to the planet. And um, so what they did was, well, supposing that's the case, well, how big a planet and where would it be in order to cause that effect? And so they did some calculations and they said, if you look right there in the sky, you'll find another planet. And what do you know they did? And it was Neptune. So this is a practical significance. You don't throw the theory out with the first anomaly. Now, later on, people noticed that the planet Mercury was coming, uh, was orbiting the sun, and the place where it was closest to the sun was migrating around. And some of that could be explained by Newtonian physics, but not much of it. And most of it was way too fast. And so people said, well, maybe there's another planet inside uh, Mercury's orbit, and they called it Vulcan. And they started calculating how big a planet would have to be and where it would have to be. They couldn't find the planet. Now, what we understand that a better answer for that is that, in fact, you're looking at relativistic effects. And as Mercury comes closer to the sun, it's moving faster. And therefore, it becomes heavier. And so general relativity was able to predict how fast Mercury's orbit should go, and standard Newtonian gravity couldn't. And that's one of the evidences that was used to say that Einstein was closer to the truth than Newton. So sometimes it's OK to do those kinds of excuses and those anomalies and set them on the shelf, and sometimes it isn't. And when do you know what to do?
And finally, of course, people can say, well, that data is no good. It conflicts with our theory. And of course, when do you know when that's legitimate and when it doesn't? Well, the fact of the matter is you don't. And you're having to make judgments based on incomplete and inaccurate information. And as the later Karl Popper finally said, the empirical basis of objective science has thus nothing absolute about it. So now we're down to science is totally, at least partly, relative. As um, a brilliant Hungarian by the name of Imre Lakatos, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, L-A-K-T-O-S, um, said, even mathematics is subject to uncertainty. And he was able to demonstrate that some things that people thought were proved mathematically, in fact, weren't. Now we're into basically all of human knowledge is uncertain. So the question is, do we just throw it all out? Well, it's hard to do that. It's hard to do that in a medical school who's, that's devoted to healing people and notes that studies actually mean something in terms of how patients generally behave. It's also hard to do that in terms of saying, you know, if you build a rocket this big with this fast firing e mechanism and stuff, you can put people all the way to the moon. That was done on science. It was done, by the way, on inaccurate science. The, the math for relativity is too complicated, so they just used the Newtonian math, and it was good enough. Uh, Lakatus seemed to indicate that science perhaps wasn't dealing with an absolute truth that you could actually prove. And so what he decided to do was to try to describe science as he saw it best. And his description is probably the best that we have if you do a few modifications on it. Uh, number one is you're dealing with a core theory. And that core theory kind of has the, you know, the idea of gravitation, for example. And then there are things that are called heuristics, and that's just deriv derived from a Greek word, which means uh, to find. How you go about uh, using the theory to find uh, what the theory pre predicts. Um, uh, most of you may have heard of Heureka, or Eureka, as it's commonly described. That's I have found it. Uh, And um, then there are kind of belts of theories around the core theory that commonly get modified in order to make the theory correspond to reality. Um, in a theory that's having trouble, they function as a protection of the main theory that the function of theories is not to be proved true by the mass of observations. It's not to be proven false by anomalies. That is actually what it's supposed to do is predict new things that you wouldn't expect. Notice, you didn't make a theory to fit everything. You made the theory in order to find new things that you wouldn't have thought of before. So for example, quantum mechanics sounds all complicated and stuff, but when you can start predicting what's happening with spectral lines in stars, and you can predict what's happening with spectral lines in, uh, let's say, sodium flame or potassium flame or hydrogen that's being subjected to electricity, and you start being able to nail, this is one line you should see, this is another line you should see, this is another line you should see, then you're starting to get stuff. And when you can predict 
that light, for example, should, if it's bouncing back and forth in certain areas, cohere. And now you have laser lights, which all of us are acquainted with, with the laser pointers that you can point at the uh, screen or perhaps point in, at your, in front of your kitten and have the kitten drive itself crazy trying to catch the light. Those are practical outcomes that would never have been suspected from another the more conventional theory. And so a theory that continually keeps popping these things out, well, you ought to try this, well, you ought to try this. Well, you know, if you cool uh, rubidium atoms down, they can all fit into the same space. You can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. And we have done it. Or they have done it. I haven't personally. But there are reliable reports of people cooling things down and getting what they call Bose-Einstein condensates. Einstein didn't like quantum mechanics, but he was still good at it. Um, and finally, if you have stubborn facts, or more precisely, stubborn combinations of facts, they can, in fact, produce a crisis in a theory. And a theory can degenerate relatively rapidly if you have enough of these facts that just won't fit in with it to the point where eventually the theory can either get watered down extremely or can disappear or at least be ignored. Now, I don't think that theories should be thrown away if they're useful. And that, by the way, includes the theory of evolution. I think that there are some places where the theory of evolution actually does fit and uh, one should believe it. But to say that doesn't mean you believe that the theory covers everything. And finally, since you're not having absolute truth, induction should be allowed back into science. And let me explain to you why it's not absolute truth. It's very simple. All swans are white. Well, you just don't see black swans. You just don't. That is until you go to uh, uh, Australia and then they're all black. And people over there would formulate this question exactly the reverse way, all swans are black. Well, what that's trying to tell you is that if all the swans you've ever seen are white, it's probably a good idea to think that the next swan you see is gonna be white. You can't hold that as an absolute rule but it does make sense. And in fact, if you don't do that, you're in trouble. Uh, science is a study of the reproducible. And if we study particles carefully, we assume that particles that we haven't studied that are the same kind of particles, say electrons or protons or neutrons or uh, helium nuclei, that the ones that we aren't studying are going to be pretty much the same as the ones we're studying. And in medicine, we assume that patients who are outside of a study are going to behave pretty much like the patients that are inside the study. Otherwise, what's the point of doing a study if you can't generalize? Finally, well, a, a new theory needs to account for all the truth explained by its predecessor. This is one of the things that relativity did very, very well. All of the wonderful successes of gravity are still true if you're using relat uh, general relativity. There will be some modifications, and where the modifications are, general relativity is better. But it doesn't say that gravity was a totally false theory. It's especially if you realize that gravity didn't have a mechanism and therefore was just a description. As long as you keep science as description and not as we've got the truth. And now, there's a couple other people that have talked about science that I'm going to say I have trouble buying, although Kuhn has a point in that there is a social component to scientific theories and attitudes. 
Um, but if you read him carefully, he comes very close to, and I think if you read him sympathetically, he actually kind of says that there are different evidences and that uh, uh, that if you get if you move from one paradigm to another you're actually changing reality and so i'm i'm I have trouble with that, and I think that he's a little too postmodern and for one thing, I think that you can work within different paradigms and Kuhn seemed to insist you couldn't. Now, um, and, and, and finally, if, if, if the job of standard science is puzzle solving, that presumes that this particular puzzle has, in fact, a solution. And if you look hard enough, you can find it. Which means that you are, in fact, actually dealing with truth that perhaps you can't get it exactly, but that there is some truth out there. And uh, the final one that uh, that's probably you need to know about if you're dealing with uh, uh, philosophy of science is Feyerabend, who says anything goes in science. And uh, while I think you can argue that science has gotten information from all kinds of strange <laughs> places, including dreams, um, I think you can argue that God wanted Kukuli to find the structure of the benzene molecule and helped him out a little. Um, I think that to say that it really doesn't matter what method you use, that science should be totally uh, non-judgmental, I think is too much. I think there actually are some things that, for example, I think that observation should trump theory most of the time. If push comes to shove, if you see stuff, it's more important than what you think you ought to be seeing. That the theory needs to be modified rather than the evidence. And uh, I'll just uh, uh, close this part of it with a kind of a, something that I wrote in Scientific Theology, uh, Chapter 1. Perhaps my own philosophy of science might be summed up as follows. I believe that there is an absolute truth and that we can approximate it. I also believe that everything we do and even that we perceive is more or less fallible. That includes our application of methodological rules. Therefore, there is no method that can give an ironclad guarantee of success, and I would add to that, or that is guaranteed to fail. Uh, perhaps we should call our rules principles. I do not call them values unless they are distinguished from Kuhn's values, as they are not intended to be our own arbitrary creation, but rather a partial recognition of an external reality. Some of these principles are as follows. A, in general, the most obvious interpretation of sense experience should be preferred. I'm not a fan of, if it's strange, it must be true. Uh, B, observations are the card of final approval appeal. They are actually our only windows into the objective universe to see if our theories match reality. C, inductive arguments, although not probative, are suggestive. D, anomalies or falsifications should have more tension than most corroborating evidence. Um, this fits my theory, that fits my theory, but it's really got a problem here. That's an important thing to pay attention to. Uh, B, E, novel facts should have more attention even than anomalies. And in a psychologically charged environment, novel facts that are collected in a blinded matter have the most corroborating value. And that's why we do double blind studies to find out what's going on is because we don't want to put our thumb on the scale either way. One, F, one should always work with the best known version of a theory, especially an opposing one. That is, we have no business setting up straw men to argue against. G, theories should either be logically connected and evaluated together or else not connected and evaluated separately. H, since all our theories as well as our factual knowledge are likely to be at least partially imperfect, the presence of anomalies should not cause us to immediately abandon a theory. A theory should not be abandoned completely until a better one can take its place. And finally, I, if two or more principles are more or less evenly balanced on opposite sides of an argument, which happens, withhold judgment unless you're forced to act, 
or the risks are minimal, and then make your best guess and act accordingly. In the meantime, try to see if you can resolve the dispute by collecting more data. In this case, it is a good idea to work in both research programs, and it can usually be done easily, contrary to Kuhn. Well, at least it can be done if you want to. That means you have to understand both sides of the argument. Now, there's a couple of things that I'll point out. I haven't covered experimental or observational science versus historical science very thoroughly. I think it's an important subject. Um, the subject of historical science is not amenable to direct experimentation. If you want to find out uh, uh, whether a layer was formed by a massive tidal wave, you can't create massive tidal waves. All you can do is model them and see whether it fits or not. So you're not dealing with the same kind of thing as you're dealing with if you want to see whether an electron behaves in a particular way in a magnetic field. Experiments can be spun off of abductive inter inferences. So I don't want to say, for example, that, sci that science uh, 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 it cannot be done in historical science. That you, there's no place where re reproducibility is important. On the other hand, it's not the same kind of reproducibility as you have in regular science. And by the way, where there are cases where you can't do certain things in regular science, it becomes in some ways uh, as unreliable as historical science. Um, predictions of uh, historical science are usually much mushier than those of, of, uh, of observational science. And because of all that, um, I, have, uh, I think you have to be careful about how you judge intelligent design um, in terms of science. I think you also have to be careful as how you judge evolution as science. But I do think that both of them do fall into the category of historical science and they are partially testable. And therefore, I think they should be tested. But they are both, if I can call it that, second class science. What about mind? Can you put mind into science? Well, as a matter of fact, quantum mechanics kind of suggests that mind determines part of reality and that matter isn't real. I told you about atoms stacking them all in the same place. How do you do that with real objects? You can have a photon or an electron go through two slits at the same time. How do you do that with a unitary particle? Well, it only does that if you're not looking. If you're looking, all of a sudden it went through one slit or the other. It's just totally bizarre what happens if you try to think of an electron as a real particle. And you can determine whether a photon went on one side of a galaxy, on the other side. Well, you actually can't determine which side it goes on. But you can determine on whether it went on one side of a galaxy or the other, or whether it went around both sides, depending on what you do with it once it gets down to Earth. That is, you can reach into the far distant past and into the way out distance and determine which way a photon is going. And that's what quantum mechanics will tell you. And none of the quantum mechanics people will challenge the, uh, the uh, accuracy of that statement. A theory that takes into account the thoughts and actions of minds is therefore not unscientific, which means that the bare bones of intelligent design is not scientific. Now, once you go from there and you try to get to God, then you may be stepping outside of science, but you are not necessarily stepping outside of truth. Because remember, science is only the study of the reproducible. If there are things that are not irreproducible, but they're still true, 
then science does not encompass all truth. And you can do one of two things. You can either extend science to the study of all truth, in which case you're going to have to admit that all truth may not be reproducible and may not behave like classic science. Or you can say, well, science has a limited view, and we need to acknowledge that there are things outside of science. You can go either way. But you can't just simply say, well, I'm going to stick with science as a study of the reproducible, and science as a study of all truth. You can't do that. Because that's trying to define your way out of the problem. Well, what about consensus in science? Well, consensus, frankly, is overused, and it's overused precisely where it shouldn't be. Consensus, if taken to its logical conclusion, would completely prevent any advancement of science. Think about it. Young Einstein is proposing a theory. Well, nobody else believes in the theory. Shouldn't Einstein just simply take everybody else's word for it? In which case, he never proposes a new theory, right? So consensus is not the way to determine truth. All observers will agree does one other thing that you might not notice at first glance, and that is it, is, it allows a determined minority to block any conclusion that they don't want people to believe. You see, all, all, ob all ob observers agree, well, except for me, I don't agree with that, and therefore that's not a conclusion of science. Which means that if you are an atheist, you just simply won't agree with anything that might have implications that uh, suggest a God. And that has been used. And it's about as useful as the old text have any of the uh, Pharisees or the leaders believed on him. And once you do that, science can no longer be self-correcting, which is one of its big selling points. Once you say that science uh, is what all scientists believe, then you, you, nothing ever gets fixed. Now, I'm going to say a couple of other things. Since the line between science and non-science is fuzzy, perhaps we should apply the method of science, as outlined above, with appropriate modifications to other disciplines, including theology. And if you're wondering what the book Scientific Theology was trying to argue, it was that precise point. Perhaps we do that to some extent already without realizing it, as Thessalonians talks about testing all things and holding fast to what is good. And uh, I have one final point, and then uh, the discussion can start. Uh, the basic equations of physics can be written on a napkin, if you're English, we'll call it a serviette. Um, and perhaps a theology that is fundamentally simple will prove to have similar usefulness and approximate the divine reality similarly. Although there is also the argument that I think is also fair that uh, nuclear physics is a very complicated subject. <coughs> simple in the underlying uh, rules, but complicated on applying those rules. And as C.S. Lewis said, good theology will probably turn out to be as complicated as nuclear physics and for precisely the same reason. And finally, I think that it's important that our theology not run away from science. I think if it does, we're in trouble. Theoretically, the claim of Yahweh, is that he is the God of all creation. That's what the term Yahweh means. Practically, the Bible has been able to function as a fruitful source of apparently successful scientific hypotheses. And if you doubt that, I've written an article that's available on the internet in Origins that makes that very point. And in the next few weeks, 
we will be seeing some of that evidence and we've outlined some of it. That's my take. Now it's your turn. Go ahead, Ariel. Do you want me to go ahead? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a, a couple of um, observations. Uh, a very good summary here of the, uh, the history. Uh, the one thing I would uh, hope, and I, I think uh, <coughs> it'll happen anyway, uh, you'd include in the introduction where you talk various topics, is uh, the evidence for the Genesis Flood. Now, some of the topics you didn't do cover that, but I'm, I'm thinking of uh, uh, rapid deposition, the change in science towards catastrophism. The and turbidites, I think, are part of that. And the extremely uh, widespread uh, nature of deposits that you can't uh, reconcile with uh, ordinary uh, development. Uh, yeah, that's also yeah, so in the list, actually. So, it, uh, so uh, the flood is so extremely important to this issue of time and uh, of uh, uh, recent creation. That uh, the, the other point, I, uh, I hope that uh, Kuhn doesn't uh, destroy the sociology of science. This is extremely important, the sociology of science. Uh, it, uh, the, um, the behavior of the scientific community. A community like the scientific community, which can ridicule plate tectonics, uh, and five years later ridicule anybody who doesn't believe in it, tells you that uh, it's behaving as a solid body not as independent investigators. And this, I think, is uh, uh, highly significant as we try and interpret truth. Uh, there's a strong sociological component in science that needs to be recognized. Well, uh, there definitely is a, a sociological component to science as practiced currently. I think that that's a bad mark on science rather than a description of how science should be done. And uh, uh, for example, I'm, I'm appalled by the idea that there are now multiple papers that were produced by a computer to sound wonderful and have no actual meaning behind them. It's like a, a hundred or 120 or something like that that got spread out to various scientific journals and they took them. Something is wrong here. And it got published. Yeah, they got published. <laughs> you know, the Sokol thing where Sokol made fun of all of the social scientists, well, it turns out that the natural scientists aren't a lot better. Mm. Uh, and, and it bothers me. It, one of the things that really bothers me is that there are people who come up and said this much. Well, you know what science is really about. It's get about getting grant money and producing papers. Mm. I, I, I hope that that's not the standard for science. I certainly, it shouldn't be the standard for science. Not that publishing papers is a bad thing. Not that getting grant money is a bad thing. But when you make it as your goal, those are the two things you're going to do then it seems to me that you've sacrificed truth, and that's really what you ought to be aiming for. Um, yeah, after you're done, hand the mic back. Uh, the thing that bothers me whenever we deal with historical quote-unquote science is that um, there is a little fallacy I've, I've, I've come to call the fallacy of the plausible argument. <laughs> you know, we come up with a good scenario how something could have happened, and we almost take it as an unfalsifiable truth 
that that's precisely how things had to have happened. And, and that's a bit of a problem because whenever we do real experiments on the bench, we do not follow that kind of an argument or that kind of thinking. In fact, we look at repeatedly how many different ways something's bound to happen, and then we try to draw some kind of mm, statistical conclusion from how many different ways we've looked at something. And does looking at something from many different sides yield a congruent, concordant insight? Or when I look at it from different angles, do I come up with dramatically different conclusions? That is a big problem. Well, I can give you an, an illustration of that uh, right off the top of my head. For a long time, it was assumed, I think by everybody, including creationists, that peacocks had those feathers to impress peahens. <laughs> well, it turns out that the peahens aren't all that impressed. <laughs> uh, that, you know, you can put extra feathers on, or you can take feathers off, and you know, the peahens kind of whatever. Uh, which, of course, means that it's really hard to explain this on the basis the peahens are looking. You know, I like those eyes better than those eyes. I think I'll go with this guy. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, and yet, it was such a logical conclusion. It was such a you know, natural assumption um, until somebody actually went to test it. And those are some of the kinds of things that we have to be careful with. Yes. First, I'd like to uh, congratulate you on covering a tremendous range of human knowledge. I apologize uh, it took me over In a little an hour. less than an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I find myself in agreement with uh, a great deal of it. Uh, but I'd like to make a couple of observations. I re uh, first, that. Uh, That's part of what we're here for in talking about philosophy and science and then giving us a taxonomy of both uh, and some definitions of essential concepts in both fields, you have done something uh, that is integrated and complete and whole and points you toward what you just mentioned you're going to cover next week, that it is possible that there's such a thing as scientific theology. And uh, to establish the basis for that conclusion, you've shown certain similarities between philosophy on the one hand, which gets into the field of religion, and science on the other hand, which is usually regarded as being opposed to religion, but which deals with questions that very clearly bear on religion. But I do want to mention, as a former professor of both psychology and philosophy, and a practicing psychologist, clinical psychologist, for about 40 years, a couple of differences that I would have with you over what you've said, not so much to say that I'm right and you're wrong, or even to raise the question of which of us is right, but just to point out that there are different ways of looking at this, mm -hmm. and that taxonomies do have consequences. Your taxonomy, as you're setting it up on both, is going to lay the groundwork for a scientific theology. But you could use different uh, taxonomies. The old saying, no matter how you slice it, it's still baloney. You can slice the baloney of philosophy or science one way, and I can slice it a different way. And depending on how we slice it, it'll push us toward different conclusions when you come to the questions next week that you're going to deal with as scientific uh, theology possible. And the differences I wanted to point out would kind of push us in another direction if you happen to think that way. For one thing, I wouldn't agree with you that uh, philosophy, uh, or that rather that science is still a branch of philosophy. It certainly started out that way, and we still have the habit of conferring PhDs on scientists. But I think the one thing that sets science apart 
from philosophy, two things actually, is that science confines itself to the study of nature and that it uses what's called scientific method in studying nature, which mostly consists of observation, experimentation, and logical analysis, including mathematical analysis. Now, of course, philosophy, to some extent, shares some of this with science. It does not use experimental method. Uh, it does, if you confine it to logical positivism, uh, use at least the nomenclature of mathematics and, and uh, experimental science a good deal. In fact, a lot of logical positivists I happen to study in a hotbed of it at UCLA when I was working on my doctorate, and they didn't feel any question was a philosophical question unless you could put it in symbolic logic. And of course, Bertrand Russell and Whitehead had argued <laughs> that mathematics is just a branch of logic. So, uh, they would dismiss whole realms of philosophy as not being philosophy because you couldn't put it into this scientific format of mathematical symbolic logic and deal with questions that science would deal with. But when you dealt with values, for instance, A.J. Ayer and others wanted to throw that out altogether. A value, he says, is nothing but an emotional ejaculation. I like X. I wish you did too, but that's as far as it goes. There's no way of proving that X has any reality or is binding on anybody that doesn't happen to like that. And uh, the other principal problem is that science doesn't really deal with metaphysical questions, at least if by that you mean things that go beyond nature and things that go beyond experience or the possibility of observation. The only exception to that is inferences that might be drawn from mm -hmm. what is observed. Mm -hmm. And I would tend to disagree with you somewhat there that science has kind of got away from induction. We may be defining induction differently. I think induction has always been at the core of science, if by that you mean observing particulars and then trying to make generalizations from them, either in the form of paradigms or in the form of testable theories that make prediction, I mean, uh, formula and so on that make predictions. So with those differences and notice, noting that you've kind of set the field up to go toward where you want to go next week, uh, when I come next week, I hope I'll, I'll be interested to see if some of these things I said might give a different view and a different way on the question. I, I think they may. Um, I'll just uh, make the, uh, the comment. Uh, I think it is important that we not limit our discussion to science because we are looking for truth and I put truth as superior to science and hence uh, uh, and there's so many different ways of d defining science uh, but uh, really you know it does tend to limit itself to, to uh, as just it was just mentioned to the study of nature per se uh, but it, it speculates way beyond that uh, very freely uh, many times, and so that, that's not a very solid uh, uh, factor. But uh, above all this, we want to look, we want an eclectic approach. We want to look at the whole picture from all information that we have, whether it be history, uh, whether it be uh, a religious aspect, whether it be the natural aspect, I think we need to put all that together if we're looking for truth. Well, I, I think that's probably true. And, and if all science is not reproducible, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, if science is only the study of reproducible and all reality is not reproducible, then by definition, if we're looking for truth, we have to go outside of science. Yeah. But th th there, may, there may be some aspects of science that aren't reproducible. The single event, 
uh, should not be ignored. You 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 refer to that yourself. You know. Yes. Well, uh, the the other thing is, of course, every event starts out single. So uh, there's a certain there's a sense in which science does in fact include singularities or uh, you know uh, single events as part of its uh, study. And the other th and this is one of the reasons why the the borders of science are so murky is because, well, what do you do if you, if you propose multiple universes? Is that a scientific theory or not? It's certainly proposed by a whole bunch of scientists, but is it reproducible? Uh, is there some way that you can do reproducible experiments on these multiple universes? Uh, now, where, where are you going to draw the lines of science? The Big Bang is only one. If, assuming that the Big Bang is correct, the Big Bang can only happen one time. Uh, is that science? And those are the kinds of questions that you have to ask if you're, as, as a scientist, you can kind of, you know, contract back into your little cubby hole and say whatever you want to. If you're looking for truth, now what are you going to do with those kinds of things? That's why the division between science and non-science is so difficult. You know, you can kind of start here and say this is science. You can kind of start there and you say this is non-science. But where does the transition begin? It's very much like the question of if you have a heap of wheat. How many grains of wheat do you have to have to have a, a heap? You know, does it become a heap at 100 grains, at 1,000 grains, at a million grains, at 735 grains? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, it kind of grades. Yes. Eternal truths do not change. But as humans, every generation reinterprets what, what eternal truths are because we don't really understand eternal truths. And, and I'll use a, a little example from a personal nature. We can all laugh at this. Uh, yesterday, I spent a good deal of the day talking creation evolution with the new chairman of the pathology department. This morning, I met the old chairman of the pathology department, and he says, I'm retired as of today. This is my first day in retirement. Uh, they're both my relatives, but they're very different in how they view what science is. And I'll leave it at that. It'll become apparent. Uh, many years ago, the valedictorian in uh, Harvard University addressed the class saying, in this life everything goes as long as you don't take your beliefs as absolute truth. You see that the, the attack is on absolute truth. Um, you are using Taigan for many years. Even on a one-month-old vomiting, you'd give it rectally 100 milligrams. The kid would, suddenly Zofran came in the market Tagan is terrible, we cannot use it anymore. You see, what was scientific one day, boom, it's not there anymore. You know, science changes, the Bible never does. It's, it was whatever it was before, it's the same way today. Dropery doll is another uh, example. But you see, what we are getting into right now, I think is beautiful. If I were to suggest anything, I would probably change the title. It's not what every seven day Adventist scientists should know, but wh perhaps what every seven day Adventist should know. Um. I'm not going to put that burden at this point on every Adventist for the simple reason some people just science, it's out of their league and you know they're musicians because they're really good at music and they can't, they can't do algebra, you know. Uh, and I have sympathy for that person and I don't feel like we should say every Adventist needs absolutely has to have this. What's happening though Paul is that um, very recently someone told me that 80 percent of Adventist kids are leaving the church. This is terrible. Uh, I travel quite a bit. Uh, uh, in the third world countries people are getting more materialistic. Over here we don't even know what we believe in anymore and Hollywood and Bollywood find uh, their ways right into the bedroom of very 
believing Seventh day Adventists. So, so there is no balance anymore. Perhaps we could go into college level for what we're doing and high school level, elementary school level. Um, Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories could be Uncle Paul's bedtime stories, you see. And uh, you know, we, we need to appeal to these kids. I'm very passionate about this. You know, I mean, I put whatever I can into this, if indeed we can market this all over. You see, you went to the church, right, in the first? <laughs> okay, you see, uh, you know, I mean, they, there's, there's human marketing going on right within the Adventist church. We're losing, we're, mar we're losing 80% of our kids. Well, uh, well, see, here's the thing. Uh, it, it's arguable that every Adventist should know everything. No, okay, but you have to start somewhere, and I think that to say that if you're going to deal with science, you really need to have such uh, certain kinds of scientific background. Look, there are things, to next week will be an example, that have been discovered partly by Adventists that are, have to do with science and religion that nobody's paying attention to. It's our, it's our duty, perhaps, to, to make this so appealing that they will... Put it in comic form. It doesn't matter whichever way we can. Uh, because, you know, we are all number oriented. Uh, uh, we have 20 million or whatever Seventh day Adventists. No, I, I think that it's wrong to me. To me, absolute truth can be presented in a, in a beautiful way to the kids and little kids and, and young adults. Yeah. I, I, I'm a product of Adventist uh, right. system, school system, different countries. You see, and it's we're lacking terribly in our science department, you know. And then the kids uh, watch television, then they talk with their peers, you know, well, and boom, boom goes let, our let's, faith. Let's just ask, you know, how many people when they were going through Adventist schools heard about and these things have been around for ages. They're not relatively new. The, uh, some of this is new stuff and I'm going to give you, you know, as close as I can to cutting edge. Uh, but some of this stuff has been around for a long time. How many of you have heard about paraconformities, about layers that lay down on top of other layers that there's millions of years in between in school? One. Uh, you know, can I say that we really have kind of fallen down on the job? When we put together a convention to bring our science teachers together and bring to them this information. Now, I will say, we're trying to change that. One of the things that I will personally be doing is presenting something in April to the, uh, and you'll get a foretaste of it to next week, uh, in April to the, um, uh, Grico, I think it's called, and then, and then again in August, to the um, to a convention of, of teachers. So we're trying to do this. I'm trying. Uh, if uh, one of the things I hope is that this series of videos will be at least the start of something. It's not as good as somebody writing a book because you can read a book a lot faster and you can go back to it and, and it has references that are all written down, although you, know, you can't always stop the frame and go and, and look at the references that I put up. Um, but uh, we're hoping that, that we can change some of this and, and we're actively working at it, but this is part of what I'm doing right now is trying to call attention to these are the things that we really need to Beautiful. Know. We should have been doing this a long time ago. But again, if this makes sense, that we can really go to kids' levels and elementary school, high school level, different levels. If someone would want to do this, this would be a great project and can never tell mm -hmm. how many lives we touch around the world. Oh, you're absolutely right. Around the world. Uh, yeah, we have a comment in the back here. It's a microphone. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. And speak into the mic. We want your we want your voice. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, so come back next week, and we'll we'll go into carbon fourteen and fossil carbon, and. Uh,
the history and the data and you'll those of you who have seen it will get a refresher course. So those of you who have not seen it, uh, I think will be pleasantly surprised. Thank you. I was just going to say that um, the professor down here was mentioning that truth truth always has to has to trump um, science because without truth, science is meaningless anyway. It's just a bunch of nonsense. And in fact, we're seeing that happen. I think that that's what this emphasis on grants and <coughs> publications and who cares whether you're actually correct or not is doing. Is it st we're starting to see the effects of a kind of a postmodern uh, lack of morality. Yeah, of course, in its, I think in its purest form, science should be the most honest profession that exists. You're absolutely right, it should. But you know, uh, I, I mean, did you did you notice there was an article that um, that um, uh, Danilo, or Danilo, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Daniel, has <laughs> science has lost its way, costing all of us. And they document that of 53 major studies that a group of investors wanted to check and make sure that they were really correct because they're going to put all this money into it. They want to know whether it's true or not. They tried to repeat it, and they found out that 47 of them couldn't be repeated. I, you, these were not the, you know, the outlying stuff where people were just, these were fundamental papers that everybody was quoting. And you know, there's something wrong with science when it does that. There just is. Well, I think a lot of um, politics you know, money, those kinds of things has entered into the scientific com community. But I also think that man has looked to science as a god. And maybe this is one way of God humbling us, too. You know, you, it, God is the only one who truly has answers for us. Now, that doesn't mean we don't use science and other ways to study and get information. I'm a little troubled by the, the when you say absolute truth. How can you define that? I've, I've also, you know, when you say we as Adventist Church have the truth, what is the truth? And in my own personal experience, I, you know, God, there is a God. To me, that is what I would define as an absolute yeah. truth. Amen. But everything else, how, I mean, you know, what is God like? What, uh, you know, his characteristics? And again, each person, I, I am very convinced that each person has a very individual relationship with God, and that is what he wants. So we also have to be very careful when we're um, talking to people about their experiences and so forth with mm -hmm. God, you know, and being judgmental mm -hmm. and, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. I'm getting a little off the topic here. But I do think we have to be careful when we're saying we have the absolute truth. <laughs> Or we have the truth. God yeah. Right. We, right. We, but we, we also, with the understanding, you said the Bible has been around for a long time, and it has. But my understanding is different of the Bible now than it was when I was, say, 10 years old. That, that was yours. That's your understanding. But the truth was, is the same. But our understanding, some people say truth is progressive. No, no, no. Our understanding of the truth is progressive. Well, we hope it is, yes. <laughs> That's the intent. <laughs> we hope it yes. is, yes. Our yes. Of the truth is progressive. That's truth yes. That's truth the only way is not grow. progressive. Truth is truth. You see? That's why, you know, search the scriptures. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. That, they, that testify of me. Unfortunately, many translations, you don't find the text. Yes, but Jesus was saying that, you know, like in, in the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, you, you think that you, you know, because of your beliefs, that that's what saves you. It doesn't. That's what got them into trouble. And yeah. so I guess what I'm saying is whatever we're dealing with is we need to be very careful and we need to be very respectful of each other. And and information that's what we're teach we're trying to find correct information mm -hmm. in the scientific community yes and uh, which is because what, you, I hope what to was be a truth n yesterday isn't yeah. necessarily a truth now you see what i'm saying 
Well, so which is what we are hoping to do this coming week, is to give some information that's out there uh, and invite, you know, people, uh, believers, skeptics, the like, you know, to, to look at the information, to challenge it if, if necessary, to add to it, to, uh, cr you know, whatever. It's a process of... We, we must never confuse our understanding with the truth as it is in God. That is correct. You see, uh, obviously you grew up an Adventist. You see, uh, we have prided ourselves. We have the truth. We, come on. That's, no. Uh, we, we, uh, I mean, we have, we have the triumphalistic attitude. We are the Adventists. We know everything kind of thing. We, uh, we, we did not know. And now I really realize yes. how little we know. We have the same triumphalistic attitude that science did yes. in 1904 when yes. they thought they had everything under control. Right. So we're on the same, same page. <laughs> There's no argument. Truth is one. Yes, absolutely. We, we may have the truth, but oftentimes it's not used. The question is, has the truth? Very well. Uh, the question is, does the truth the have scientists. us? That's the question. 